Hey, hey, thanks for tuning in with Goddess Idea. I want to talk about mental health. <clears throat> you know, never knew what uh, mental health, or really never heard of the term as a child, but um, even as an adult, well, I could say as a no, let me backtrack because as a teenager, I've learned of mental health, mental health illnesses because my um first husband mom had you know developed had some mental health issues um i didn't know much about it but i know that um i was pregnant with my first daughter and i was around 19 yeah i was 19 right after high school y'all i got myself pregnant by the boy across the street who chased me for like two years before i finally gave in and then marrying him and having three kids. By him and that marriage actually ended it in a domestic violence incident. But that's neither here nor there. Um, well, I was pregnant and I had came over to his house and he was like, I'm, the mom was like, I'm sorry, I lost you lost the baby. And I looked at him like, why is she saying that? And he was like, no, don't worry about it, ignore her. And then one time we had, you know, we was married this time. And so we went down south and we went down south me and my husband and my two children, we had stayed with um, his uncle. His uncle, because he had room. And so my mother-in-law, she came over and knocked on the door. And she said, why it took you so long to answer the what you was doing? What was you doing with my brother? I'm like, oh, my God, look at my husband. Like, he's like, you know, that's same mental illness. But, um, you know, that's that thought disorder. When she rests in peace. She was such a beautiful lady. Yes, she really was. Very beautiful lady. Um, anyway, I'm gonna talk about mental illness. I was diagnosed with depressive major depressive episode, panic and anxiety disorder in the early two thousand. I was like thirty. No, I wasn't thirty, I was like thirty three, thirty four, because my youngest son was like no, I was a little bit no, I had to be like thirty five, thirty six. Around yeah, about thirty five, thirty six. And um it all started with me just crying at work. I would be, I'm working as a teacher, I'm working with the infant and toddlers. And um, it's hot in here. And um, I remember I remember um, turn this to the window. I, I remember being at work, sitting on the floor and I just started crying. And I was crying uncontrollable, and my coworker was like, what's wrong? I was like, I don't know. Like, I really didn't understand why I was crying. You know, so I got myself together, and then it, it kept on happening for, like, two two weeks. And then one day I was on the train going home, and it felt like I couldn't breathe. And the more I felt like I couldn't breathe, the scarier I felt like I was going to die. So maybe I was having a heart attack. Well, I know no symptoms of heart attack. So, but that's the first thing you're gonna think if your your heart beating or you feel out of breath. That's the first thing you're gonna think if you have to, that you're having a heart attack. And that started happening. So on that day, you know, I got home. My sister was in the neighborhood, and I was telling my sister about it. She was like, "Maybe it's the bronchitis because I did have bron bronchial asthma growing up. That's what they had called it." So she walked me to Brookdale Hospital. I get to Brookdale Hospital. I started hype. I started. But now that I know that I was hyperventilating, but I started having that same feeling like I couldn't breathe. So I get in, they rushed me to the bag. They started giving me the um, asthma treatment, but I was not getting better. I just continued to have these attacks. So they sent me home. So they told me to follow up with my doctor. So I followed up with my doctor and I was explaining to him. He was like, that's not asthma. That's panic and anxiety. So... You know, he asked me some questions. I don't remember what he asked me, but, you know, I was talking about the crying and stuff and how I was feeling. So he just, you know, gave me a referral to see a psychiatrist. And that's when I was diagnosed with um, major depressive episode and panic and anxiety disorder. Now, and then I didn't really knew why this had happened to this was happening to me, where the depression come from. But through therapy and counseling and all that, I have learned that I have repressed a lot of my childhood trauma. I repressed it, and it was time for it to come out, and it came out, and the mental health, it affected me that way. So I was put on Zoloft, 
Then I couldn't sleep. I would be up for 24 hours. Then I was diagnosed with insomnia. So they put me on some kind of Rontan, which is anti seizure medication. Started taking that. And the moment after I took that, I started getting these feelings in my feet. Come to find out, they had me in a medicine for a while, but nobody was really telling me why I, my, I kept getting these feelings at my feet. Every time I would lay down or rest, I would, it just felt like something was crawling under my skin. And come to find out, that was a side effect of one of those medications I had took. That's why I'm just... Medication for me is a last resort because now that I have restless leg syndrome that I'm going to have for the rest of my life. I have um, um, a sleep disorder. I don't know if the sleep disorders contribute to the medication. Did it mess up the sleep cycle in my brain? I don't know, but I did. I used to, I did, I did snore as a teenager. My sister would tell you it was so freaking annoying that she had to hurry and get in bed because we shared the room. She had to hurry and get in bed and go to sleep before me because if if I went to sleep first, it was just a wrap. She wouldn't be able to fall asleep. She would have such a hard time because I snored so loud. So I'm saying that the medication um probably contributed. I think the medication contributed to my restless leg syndrome and my sleep disorder. Well, not all the sleep because I restless restless leg syndrome is um a, um a sleep disorder. I also have um, periodic leg movement in my sleep, which is another sleep disorder. So I think those two came from the medication. I was diagnosed with ethiopathic somnolent hypersomnolence, which means I suffer from daytime sleepiness at rare times. Um, I can get sleepy. I I don't actually fall asleep, but if I'm active and having I'm having an attack, um, I'm good. But if I'm just sitting there and that come on, I'm like, you should fall asleep. So if I'm in a place where I know I'm not supposed to be sleeping, I have to get up and move around. I got to stay active. I fall asleep, I may fall asleep on a trolley. I may do, I would doze off, wake up, doze off, trying to stay awake. Um, There was one time I fell asleep to stop before I was supposed to get off. So I, I say if I get off at 58th Street, I fell asleep at 57th Street, past 58th Street, and woke up at 60th Street. So that's why I can't get no driver's license because sitting at a stoplight, <laughs> oh no, that's a crash waiting to be happen. Happen. So, but the reason why I'm doing this video because a lot of people are not aware of mental illness. A lot of people is not educated on mental illness, and there's so many out there. Family members can have mental illness. Children can have mental illness, but they will see that they won't know it's a mental illness unless they go to the doctor and get um diagnosed. So these people with these mental illness, you know, they'll be judged. People ain't gonna want to be around them because they're gonna be like they mean they got the double. Cause this was out. Let me tell you something. When I was having them hot crying spells, people was like, "Get over it. You got kids to live for. It ain't that bad." Maybe I heard somebody say she got the double and her. That's a demon. All these negative things that people were saying about me with the mental illness, which is so sad. You know, it's so sad. You already a person who has mental illness is dealing with so much. Don't know why it's happening to them. And then you have people that are not supportive because they lack the lack 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 knowledge of um the mental health issues that people can get. And it's sad. I, and I know someone with mental illness and he's a guy and they're not sure if he had a post stress traumatic syndrome or is it bipolar or is it schizophrenia? Depression or a combination of all of them. And, you know, he was telling me how his family members would say he got the demons in him and just call him names. And they know he has a mental illness and they've been dealing with him with the mental illness um, since he was a teenager. And it's really, really sad and what he go through because, you know, if he have a combination of all of them, so they can't even give him the proper diagnosis because... All those um disorder the, the mental health mental health issues that I just just um stated all have similar symptoms. So I know for for what I experienced with this person is um they can get manic, um they get irritated, agitated, really, really like really, really quick. You can say the wrong thing to that person, that person will become manic. And what I mean, manic, where this person may start, you not know, getting into a conflict with you, and it may seem like an argument. That's to say, it's not really an argument. It's that this person is irritated, agitated, whatever, and they begin to uh, say things, curse, get loud, just get downright disrespectful to you. And 
but the person really don't mean to do this. That's just part of the mental illness. Um, another thing that I noticed about this particular person is the the communication. He has like when he has when he when this person is communicating with you, this person can go from one topic to fifteen to twenty topics in a whole conversation for forty five minutes or an hour. As long as you sit there and continue to listen to this person talk, this person is very talkative, and I think it's the mental illness. Um, talkative because the being talkative not doesn't always mean you have a mental illness, but in this particular case, you can see that this person is suffering from some from some form of mental illness because the conversation is not like me and you. Like right now, I'm talking about mental health issues. This person could be talking about mental health issues, then he could jump into um politics to something that happened yesterday to the person's childhood, and you be sitting there like. And this person has become aware that um, this is what they be doing when they be having an episode. So for me, dealing with this person, I would just let the person know that, you know, you're talking a lot right now. <laughs> and then they'll be like, okay, let me shut up. Now, they may shut up or they may just continue going. It depends on if the person is understand you or you understand the person. In this case, I understand this person because I knew this person uh for a long time and it could be great topics but it's just that this person doesn't stay on the topics and i was you know as i was having a conversation with this person last night and i was saying to the person you know you jumping from topic to topic to topic to topic and the person was like i know so i had went and i had looked up look it up and there's like different types of speeches and I'm going to, I thought I had saved it, but give me a minute. I'm going to, um, excuse me. Let me see if I can find the different types of um, speech. I don't know, it's pressure speech, I think. Pressure speech, yeah, okay, there's a couple of them. I hope they give me all of them. So, um, pressure speech is often a sign of mania or hypermania. That's when your energy level or or mood is very high and is linked to bipolar disorder. So this is why this, this can be, this person can consider having bipolar because I have seen this person be way up here or way down here. Um, then you have frenzied speech and this speech produce a difficult, is difficult to interpret. Such speech may be too fast, erratic, and relevant or too tangential for the listener to understand. It is an example of cluttered speech and is often associated with certain mental disorder, particularly a mania or schizophrenia. See, now this person has a speech that can be related to even bipolar or schizophrenia. And I know it was, um, it was too more, it was too much, it was too more, um, it was pressure speech Pressure speech, it was, um, the other one I just read, it's, it's more, it was two other ones. Yeah, so as this person, a person was talking, let me see if they have it right here. Hold on, y'all. You know, you do have people who talk too much, you know, but then you have people who talk too much, and when they're talking, you really can't relate or understand what they're talking about because the speech may be too fast, erratic, erratic, and may be too many topics being thrown around in this conversation. Then you have the disorganized speech, and this type of speech often involves rapid switching between subjects without any clear connection between the topics. You might reply to questions or answers that all others consider entirely unrelated. Sometimes disorganized speech involves slings or random words that seemingly lack a clear connection. And disorganized speech may be faster than normal speech, but it can still confuse others. When it is severe, it can get in the way of normal communication. And then you have compulsive communication. And this one is a little bit different. Um, older research exploring over communicating points out that while Many people consider talkative a positive trait. Some people take communication a bit too far. And researchers who describe this pattern as compulsive talking or talkalism outline a few key signs. 
talking a lot, often more than anyone else in most situations, struggling to talk less even while working, doing school, or other key quiet. Recognize that you talk a lot generally because others have told you so. And finding it hard to stay quiet when continuing to talk poses a problem for him. Um, I don't see this person because this person do know how to be quiet. So I don't think this person, I can apply compulsive communication to this person. But didn't this organized speech. Then you have hyperverbal refers to fast increased speech. Uh, this, is, this isn't too different from pressure speech. And sometimes professionals might use it. The two terms interchangeably. Still, hyperverbal speech won't necessarily involve quick transitions between thoughts or the use of rhymes or puns to connect thoughts as pressure speech does. So I don't think that that apply. But pressure speech and um the other one I said thought um then it really applies to this person. Then you just think about the person thought. So you will figure that if a person does have mental illness and Thought disorder is, is one mental illness that's related to schizophrenia. Um, this is what I read. I'm not no doctor or anything. This is just things that I'll be reading on. Um, that um, a person, because my brother was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, and he was saying that's a thought order, a thought disorder. So you would figure the thought disorder could kind of come out in the person's speech. You know, I don't know. That's how that works. But um, it's sad, and the reason, like I said, I was doing this video because people do lack the knowledge, and people, it's gonna be, it's frustrating dealing with someone who mental illness, especially if they're not stable, or you know, especially if they're not on medication and they're not getting proper therapy and not seeing doctors and stuff, and they're dealing with all these symptoms. So, and you're in a relationship with this person, you have a family member, and you gotta deal with this person on you know, on an ongoing basis. It can't drain you. So that's why it's good to educate yourself on the mental health issues so you can better, you know, help them as well as take care of yourself. Because there's going to be times where you'll be like, okay, I want to get away. But you don't want to hurt that person because you know it's the mental health issues that's draining you and not necessarily the person. So you have to really take care of yourself, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. If you are in a relationship with a person who has mental illness, or you may have a child or a close friend or a relative, but educate yourself on it and then just make sure that you take care of yourself. But people with mental health issues do need a lot of support. And some of their behaviors are strange and... You can't relate to them if you don't understand what's going on with them. So stop telling people that have mental illness that there's the demon, it's the spirit, and the them, all that stupid shit. No, it's a genuinely diagnosis. Schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, post-stress traumatic syndrome, post-traumatic stress syndrome, schizoaffective disorder. It's a lot of, it's a couple of them out there. And even with a lack of knowledge, you can meet someone and when they go to talk to you, you could pick up on something might not be right with the person. You can, especially if they begin to speak to you, especially if they got schizophrenia or bipolar and they communicating with you. But they also have irritability, agitation, and mood swings and a whole lot. And it's sad that they got to go through these things. And try to make the best live with it for the rest of their life. But then they have to deal with people who lack the knowledge about their diagnosis. And then they may get treated or disrespected and call names and all this crazy stuff. God is idea.